Hello everyone and welcome to our Every Nation Bryanston online experience. Thank you so much for joining us. A special shout out to you if you are joining us for the first or second time around. We want you to know that we like you already and we hope that you enjoy the service with us today. If you would like to get to know a little more about us as Every Nation Bryanston, um, please feel free to click on the connection card below this video. What that connection card will allow you to do is fill in your details. Then one of our leaders will get a hold of you in the week. Thank you again for joining us. And because you joined us today, we want to do one more special thing. And that is allow you to choose a charity of your choice that we, on your behalf, will give a hundred rand to. So on that connection card, right at the bottom, you'll find a section where there are some charities that we partner with in the city and you can choose a charity of your choice and we will donate a hundred rand to them. Today is a special day. It is Father's Day. And I want to take some time to shout out, to celebrate, to honor all the incredible fathers in our midst. To all the fathers who are part of our Every Nation Bryanston community, we want to say thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you for being pillars in our midst, but especially thank you for being men who love and cherish and care for your children. Um, we know that parenting is a marathon. So our prayer for you today is that you would receive refreshing, you would receive some restoration where needed, that you would receive some encouragement, and you would know the grace that is on you to parent your beautiful children. Thank you again, and may God bless you and increase you in every way. I know that for some of us, Father's Day is a bit of a challenging day. I myself lost my father a couple of years ago. He was an anchor for me, just such an incredible man. So for those of you who've lost your fathers, I, I just I want you to know that you have a father in heaven. You have a father in heaven who cares for you and that today take some time to be with your heavenly father and just allow him to, to father you and be present with you on this day. And I hope you all have opportunities to celebrate your fathers in, in small or big ways, whatever would be significant to you. And lastly, for those of you who have never experienced the love and the care of a father who have never experienced the protection of a father. I just want to say to you that God promises to be a father to the fatherless. So if this is a difficult day for you, you too are not alone. And I want to encourage you to take some time, even if it's five or 10 minutes, just allowing the love of your heavenly father to wash over you. We are at the tail end of our incredible series, The Greatest Story Ever. And today we have the honor of receiving teaching from one of our good friends, Harold Olokune. He will be speaking out of revelations and giving us just some in-depth insight with the limited time that we have about the book of revelations and the imagery contained in that book. Enjoy.
Hello, Every Nation Bryanston family. I trust your week is going well. I pray God's grace and favor for all of us who may be going through a challenging week. We are continuing our series with the greatest story ever. To me, it's the greatest story ever because it represents the story of the greatest man who ever lived. Jesus Christ. Last week, my man Lux came and did a splendid job showcasing us, the people of the kingdom, under the rulership of our King, Jesus Christ. So far in this series, we've been going through a journey where God created man, starting with Adam and Eve, to dwell with him and take dominion over the whole earth. In Genesis 3, man chose to create his own image as opposed to reflecting God's glorious image by eating from the wrong tree, the tree of knowledge of good and evil, or what I call the tree of disobedience. This led to a series of events culminating with Israel being born through a covenant with Abraham. That was in the BC days before Jesus Christ came. We, however, saw that through the judges and the priests and the prophets, how God, in my view, travailed with his people Israel. Eventually, through Christ, dying on the cross in order to save Israel and the rest of the world from his wrath and judgment. We then saw a new beginning with Christ Jesus coming into the earth at a point in time, living the life we should have lived and eventually dying on the cross on our behalf, resulting with the church being born on a day of Pentecost, empowered by the Holy Spirit. Now we as a people of God, the church, have a promise of a new kingdom birthed inside of us through the seed of the gospel to be materialized in the new Jerusalem when Jesus comes back to rule and reign as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. However, before the realization of this glorious new Jerusalem, when Jesus comes back to rule and reign as rightful judge, he must bring judgment to Satan and all his disciples who have rebelled against him. It's important to understand, friends, that in order to bring salvation, in order for Jesus to save us, he has to bring judgment to sin, disobedience, and rebellion. Today, with the help of the Holy Spirit, I will try and paint a picture using some of the images in the book of Revelation to show this transition of the people of God, the church, through judgment, which must come, to the coming back of Jesus to rule and reign as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, we thank you for this time, Almighty God. We thank you for your word. We know you're present today, but invite you, Holy Spirit, here and into each and every home under my voice today. Come and help us with your word. Let it not go out and come back void, but set to accomplish what you've purposed to accomplish. Holy Spirit, glorify the Father, fulfill his will, and glorify Christ in Jesus' name, amen. 
on the 3rd of June, 2022. It was a Friday afternoon. I went to a wedding. I was invited by Ivan and Nelsie, friends from church, now known as the Rohindas. Praise the Lord. They were getting married on that day. It was a beautiful afternoon. Went to the wedding during the reception processions. An amazing thing happened. Whilst we were sitting there, some of us were eating, etc. Out of nowhere, these dancers came and they were like moving their hands like this, this like Rwandese dance. And they were dancing and dancing and singing. They were singing in Rwandese. So they were dancing and singing in Rwandese and playing drums, beautiful voices moving. You know, they were like almost like floating the way they moved. It was a wonderful, wonderful time. And I watched Ivan and Nelsie because they were seated in the, you know, the royal seat as a couple that just got married. They were sitting there and all of a sudden Ivan got up and he went close to one of the dancers and he began to dance. You know, this image of him just dancing in unison with this other dancer the traditional dance and the song singing and the drums beating gave me such an amazing image and revelation and appreciation of who Ivan was. Of course, I knew he was from Rwanda, even though he was born in South Africa, because there was a time when we were, we were going for a mission to Burundi last year. And he was keen to go because of how close Burundi and Rwanda are. So I knew who Ivan was. I mean, there were times we even played soccer together. However, that day, seeing him in the traditional dance and the image of the traditional dance told me something deeper about who he is. I had a deeper appreciation of who he is. Friends, today we are going to find out a little more about Jesus, hopefully, like I found out about Ivan. You see, the book of Revelation with all the imagery that you see is the revelation of Jesus Christ. That's what it is. He is the center. And hopefully with some of the imagery that we're going to see, we will look and see how Jesus represents himself, how Jesus feels, what are some of his attributes through that book. Let's give you an example. In the book of Revelation, these are some of the References that Jesus is referred to. The glorified son of man. The lion of Judah. The worthy lamb. The son who will rule all. The bridegroom. The conquering king of kings and lord of lords. The rightful ruler of his earthly and eternal kingdom. I'd like to encourage you after this, with the help of the Holy Spirit, to go and discover this Jesus in the book of Revelation. My sermon today will look at three main imageries. The woman, the child, and the dragon in Revelation 12 the scarlet woman and the scarlet beast in Revelation 17, Jesus Christ, the king, judge, and executor in Revelation 19. So let's begin with the woman, the child, and the dragon. We're going to be reading a bit of scripture, so I'd encourage you to have your Bibles handy. I'm reading from the 
New King James Version. Revelation chapter 12 from verse 1 to 6. Now a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a garland of twelve stars. Then being with child, she cried out in labor and in pain to give birth. And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great fiery red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns, and seven diadems on his heads. His tail drew a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth, to devour her child as soon as it was born. She bore a male child, that's the woman, who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. This refers to Jesus Christ. And her child, this very same child who was to rule, was caught up to God and his throne. Then the woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God that they should feed her there 1,260 days. If you were to divide 1,260 days in the Jewish calendar or Hebraic calendar, which is a year of 360 days, you will come up with three and a half years. So we see this woman clothed with sun and a garland of 12 stars on her head. This woman is a representation of Israel, pregnant with the promise of the Messiah. The text tells us that then being with child, she cried out in labor and in pain to give birth. So she was pregnant with a promise of the Messiah, Jesus Christ. And we know that this is the Messiah because of two things from this text. One, it, he was one who would rule all nations with a rod of iron. And two, he was caught up to God and his throne. So by being him being caught up to God and his throne refers to the ascension of Jesus Christ. After his death and resurrection, there is a promise of the Messiah in this woman. And if you remember from Genesis 3, after Adam and Eve had sinned and God was passing judgment based on their sin, he had told them not to eat of that tree, but they ate of that tree and so he was judging them. And if you remember, Adam was judged that the ground will be hard for, for, for him as he plows it for, it for it to bring forth. With Eve would have pain in labor as one of the, of the judgments. However, there was also a promise. That's how merciful our God is. In the midst of that judgment, he said I will, that through the woman, there will come a child, a seed, and that seed would bruise the head of the serpent, who is Satan, and now in Revelation 12, depicted as a dragon. In Genesis 3.15, and I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. So that was the promise, friends. And this was a promise that the imagery being shown in Revelation 12 is depicting. This woman, Israel, pregnant with promise of the Messiah. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that amazing? I believe this was an encouragement to John. Because remember, this is what John was seeing. And John, where was he at that time? He was on the island of Patmos. John was in the island of Patmos. He was being persecuted in the island of Patmos. Some of his friends, the other apostles, had been killed. P 
Peter was crucified upside down. So they had been killed. And he was the only apostle left, I believe. And he was in the island of Patmos. At that time, the Christians were undergoing intense persecution. So this image of a promise of one who came and rose again because John knew Jesus had come and risen was going to rule all nations one day. So even then, when they were under the empire of Rome, under the kingdom of Rome, they had a promise of victory. I'm slightly reminded of Nelson Mandela when he was in prison crying for freedom during the realm of apartheid. You know, there was that innate conviction of freedom that is coming. John here, I believe, had a similar encouragement. However, during the time of persecution that they were in, it felt a bit far-fetched. It felt a bit far-fetched, I would believe. Have you received a promise in your life that has lingered a promise that you received and when you received it, you received it with joy and gladness because it was from God of what God was going to do. But then it lingered so long and based on the circumstances of life, you being overtaken by life, it appears that this promise will not really materialize. I can empathize with John when he was in the island of Patmos, under that intense persecution, not knowing when this ruler of all nations is going to come. Have you been in a similar situation where you find the promises, the very same promises that God has given you are far-fetched? Well, this is an encouragement, friends, because we're going to see how the Messiah, how Jesus will fulfill his promise. He will fulfill his promise. I have an example in my life. Our son, Jono. Jonathan is, I, I've always called him the Rottweiler. Our boy, if you've met John, Jonathan, you don't really get to know him. You get to experience him. That is Jonathan. I call him my Rottweiler. Ever since he was two years old, I've always called him my Rottweiler. Anyway, so Jonathan, when he was growing up, we started discovering that he suffers from ADHD. Now, those of you who may be suffering from ADHD or have friends who, or, or family who experience this challenge of ADHD would understand. So we only discovered this through the process of taking him to school. I mean, and at that particular time, we really had no idea of what ADHD is, what the symptoms are. I mean, some of us guys, the way we grew up, probably many of us had this thing, but you know, it just came and went. It was either cold laziness or cold something else. Some people argue that that ADHD was beaten out of them when they were young, who knows, but Jonathan has ADHD. That time he was about two, three years old, he was suffering from the same thing, obviously, but we didn't know it. And when we discovered it, we trusted God for a breakthrough because the medication that we were giving him, we didn't get the right one that would work for him at that age. So I remember this time when I got a call from school, he had gone, we had taken him to a school, a nice school, an expensive school. And I remember I got a call to go and fetch him 
because he was being unruly. Apparently, because of an outburst, he had had an altercation with another child and hit the child. So I'm coming, I'm rushing to the school to go and find out what is it and what's going on. And I will never forget, friends, I saw the image of him coming. He was walking with a teacher and he looked so confused and so misunderstood. And then I remember getting him and taking him home. And a couple of days later, we had a meeting with the school because they said that, look, we don't know how to handle your child. Maybe, and they recommended certain schools that, special schools that he would go to. And I remember after that meeting, I was standing at the parking lot with my wife, Grace, and there was peace in our heart because we had a promise that God would come through from jo for Jonathan. We didn't know when, but we had a promise. And God keeps his promises, friends. I can tell you now, I mean, we celebrated Jonathan's ninth birthday on the 6th of June. He goes to a school close to where we stay. He is thriving. He is doing well academically. And we managed to find a breakthrough treatment for him that just works. And he's growing up into a healthy, wonderful boy. That, my friends, is God keeping his promise. And so even though the promise may tarry, it will come. Do not give up. So let's see how this unfolds in Revelation. Enter the dragon. Revelation chapter 12, verse 13. I'm going to read verse 13 and verse 17. Now when the dragon saw that he had been cast to the earth, he persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child. So if you read earlier in the book of Revelation, we don't have time to go to it, to it Revelation 12. If you, if you carry on reading from verse 6, you will find that there's a narrative of where Satan was kicked out of heaven and, and the angels, they were kicked out of heaven. So Revelation verse 13 is of 12, 12 verse 13 is referring to now Satan having been cast down and he is angry because he's been kicked out. And he comes and he starts persecuting this woman that we saw, the bride. But then the woman is carried on wings of eagles into the wilderness and protected and covered. And the dragon realizes that he cannot get to the woman. The dragon here symbolizes Satan or the devil throughout the book of Revelation. So this dragon Satan realizes that he cannot get to the woman. And then what does he do? The Bible says in verse 17, And the dragon was enraged with the woman, and he went to make war with the rest of her offspring who keep the commandments of God and have a testimony of Jesus Christ. That is us, friends. That is you and I who are born again and follow the Lamb. That is the church. So there's a time coming depicted in Revelation 12 that will be a time of great tribulation. It will be a time of great tribulation. The offspring of the woman, which is the church, was being persecuted. This great time of tribulation is uh, referred to by Jesus himself in the book of Matthew 24, when Jesus was answering his disciples' questions regarding the sign of his coming and the end of the age, he mentions that at a point in time, and based on Revelation 12 with the dragon, this is that point in time. At a point in time in the future, there will be a great tribulation that the church is going to go through. And Jesus says that 
there will be a great tribulation like there has never been before, nor will there ever be. In Matthew 24, he even goes on to point out that if those days were not shortened, no flesh would be saved. So this is the time that this woman with her offspring, the church, is going through in this imagery in Revelation chapter 12. They are going through the great tribulation. I'm reminded by the second letter to the church in Thessalonica that, that Paul wrote. Second Thessalonians chapter 1 verse 3 to 12. We are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is fitting, because your faith grows exceedingly, and the love of every one of you all abounds toward each other, so that we ourselves boast of you among the churches of God for your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that you endure, which is manifest evidence of the righteous judgment of God that you may be counted worthy. Paul was boasting about the church in Thessalonica among the churches of God for their patience and faith in all their persecutions and tribulations that they were enduring. And he mentions in verse 5, which is manifest evidence of the righteous judgment of God, that you may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which you also suffer. We're going to get back to this shortly. So this church and this, uh, depicted by this woman in Revelation 12, is going through the tribulation, but they are enduring it. How are they enduring it? With patience, faith. What's the faith based on? The promise. The promise of what? That Jesus, the Messiah, is going to come back as a King of Kings and a Lord of Lords. And he's going to set right. He's going to set everything right. He's going to take away suffering. He's going to take away the tears from our eyes. Those of us who have been persecuted. Those of us who've been suffering because of our steadfast love, faith, and obedience to the Lamb. That is the promise. And this is the promise that keeps this woman with the church in Revelation 12 following the Lamb, submitting to the Lamb, abiding by the Lamb's commandments. If we are joined in his sufferings as the Lamb of God, we will share in his glory as the Lion of Judah. What does this mean? This means that if we align ourselves with the faith, the understanding, and the submission of the church depicted inside this woman in Revelation 12, who endures persecution, who endures the onslaught of the dragon and the beast system, which we shall look at in Revelation 17. If we are joined with that, and we are joined with Jesus as the lamb who was slain and went through suffering, if we're joined with him, we will share in his glory when he comes back as the Lion of Judah, as the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, to set things right and to take vengeance on all our enemies. And we're going to see that just now. How Jesus takes vengeance on all the enemies of the church depicted in Revelation chapter 12. Before that, we need to talk about what I call 
the strong, vehement kicks of a dying horse. We need to talk about the beast. Revelation chapter 17, verse 1 to 14. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and talked with me, saying to me, Come, I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters, with whom the kings of the earth committed fornication, and the inhabitants, inhabitants of the earth were made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast, which was full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, having in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and the filthiness of her fornication. And on her forehead a name was written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and of the abominations of the earth. I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I marveled with great amazement. But the angel said to me, why do you marvel? I will tell you the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carries her, which has seven heads and the ten horns. The beast that you saw was and is not and will ascend out of the bottomless pit and go to perdition. And those who dwell on the earth will marvel whose names are not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world when they see the beast that was and is not and yet is. Here is the mind which has wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits. There are also seven kings. Five have fallen, one is, and the other has not yet come. And when he comes, he must continue a short time and the beast that was and is not is himself also the eighth, hectic, and is of the seven and is going to perdition. The ten horns which you saw are ten kings who have received no kingdom as yet, but they receive authority for one hour as kings with the beast. These are of one mind. They will give their power and authority to the beast. This will make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb will overcome them, for he is Lord of lords and King of kings, and those who are with him are called chosen and faithful. I know it's a mouthful, but let's try and unpack this. I want to start with the beast, and then we will finish with the woman. Verse 9 says, Here is the mind which has wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits. Mostly in the book of Revelation, every time you see heads, horns, mountains, kings, crowns, they, they, they symbolize authority, rulership, head of government. That's why in Revelation 19, the Bible talks about Jesus wearing many crowns, you know, because he is king of kings and lord of lords. All right. So the seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits. These are also seven kings. Can you see? Mountains, kings, all about authority. Five have fallen. According to biblical scholars who I lean to and agree with based on understanding of scripture, the five that have fallen are head number one that's sitting on the dragon or the beast here is Egypt, which was under Pharaoh. Head number two is Assyria under Nimrod. Head number three is Babylon under Nebuchadnezzar. Head number four is Persia under Cyrus. Head number five is Greece under Alexander. So those are the five that have fallen. Remember when the apostle John was writing, who were they under? They were under the Roman Empire. One is... So that's the one is that John is referring to. That was Rome, which was under Emperor Nero at the time. And the other has not yet come. And when he comes, he must continue a short time. This other that has not yet come, some biblical scholars, which I lean to, 
say is the Islamic Caliphate. And the reason why they say it's the Islamic Caliphate because around 630 AD, the Islamic Caliphate attacked some of the stronghold territories of Rome, the Roman Empire at the time, and they defeated them in the battle, in battle. And that defeat was seen historically as when the new regime of the Islamic Caliphate took over at that time. Please do your research. I'm happy to engage on that. Verse 11, and the beast that was, was and is not is himself also the eighth and is of the seven and is going to perdition. In simple terms, this beast is a beast system. And that's the beast system that the woman is sitting on at the moment, according to Revelation 17. Now, the woman sitting on, which we shall address now, is also a type of a rulership, a type of an empire, a type of a governance that is sitting on this woman, on the beast, sorry. So the beast is essentially a beast system that will arise and the leader of this beast kingdom is going to be the beast who is the Antichrist. Now the Antichrist is going to be a ruler and has been depicted by the word of God to be that is going to be a man. Uh, Paul calls him the son of perdition. Um, Revelation 17 says the beast that you saw, this is verse 8, was and is not and will ascend out of the bottomless pit. Based on, on scripture, the things that come out of the bottomless pit pit are normally demons or fallen angels. That's where they are tied, right? And even in Revelation 20, if you go read Revelation 20, you see before Jesus comes back to take over and be ruler of the earth, an angel ties Satan and throws him into the bottomless pit for a thousand years. So this beast kingdom is going to be ruled by part human, part supernatural evil, part beast system. And verse 12 tells us that the 10 horns which you saw are 10 kings. So these are 10 rulerships that are coming that are going to give their allegiance to the beast to rule over them. All right. Now that we've hopefully tackle the beast here. Let's look at this woman. If you remember, Revelation 12 spoke about the faithful church, the faithful woman, the faithful people of God, the faithful people who have chosen to submit their will to the Lamb, to submit their uh, will and purposes to Jesus. They've chosen to keep God's commandments as a representation of their love. And this is why they have been even able to overcome. The Bible says in the same Revelation 12 that these who follow the Lamb where he goes, they overcame the dragon. They overcame the persecution of the beast system by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they did not love their lives to the death. However, this other woman is very different. This is the exact opposite. This is the unfaithful bride. You know, the Bible refers to her as Mystery Babylon, Mother of Halots. What does that mean? This is a people symbolized by this woman, a people who have chosen to renounce and reject the Messiah. They've chosen to reject the Lamb. They've chosen to reject his ways and choose their own ways. Just like the Israelites, after they had been delivered from Egypt and they went 
and Moses was in the mountain receiving the Ten Commandments, they went back to the ways of the Egyptians of worshiping idols. They had rejected the very same God who delivered them. And they chose to worship God the way they want to worship God as opposed to the way God wants to be worshipped. That is the type of person Revelation 17 is talking about. The same person who is depicted by Nimrod and Babylon in Genesis chapter 11, where God gave them the commandment to spread out, to multiply and fill the earth. But what they said is, no, 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 we're not going to do that. We're going to huddle together and we're going to build this Tower of Babel so that it can be so high, close to the heavens, so that we can be like God, so that God will not destroy us like, uh, with the flood. We're going to build a tower so big that even the flood that destroyed the people during Noah's time is not going to touch us. They chose their own way. They decided to worship their self, themselves. This is the kind of woman that is being symbolized in Revelation 17. Just like Adam and Eve, who chose. You know, the Bible in Genesis 3 does not say that Satan cast a spell on Adam and Eve for them to eat of that tree. The Bible says that Eve saw that it was good so that it would taste nice. So this was all about Eve choosing her own wants, desires, and conveniences over what the Lord had said. This is the woman being depicted. She has chosen her own way. She's described as a corrupt Babylonian empire and an idolatrous apostate religious system. An apostate church that has renounced the ways of the Lord Jesus Christ. Friends, considering this mystery woman, considering the corrupt Babylonian system that she is going to be under, and you will, you will note that from time immemorial, from Genesis, those who have chosen to reject the ways of God and choose their own way, those who've chosen to reject the worship of God and choose their own worship, have ended up being corrupt, evil, and we've seen through the series God has dealt with them every single time. Friends, I'd like to ask you, which woman do you choose? Which woman are you aligned to? Are you aligned to Revelation 12 image? of a woman that overcame the dragon by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony and they did not love their lives to death? Or are you aligned to the Revelation 17 woman? The Bible says that this woman made the inhabitants of the earth drunk with the wine of her fornication. Can you commit fornication without loving your life and putting yourself first? So these images, I believe, is God saying to us, I present before you life and death. Choose life. Choose life. If we are joined in his sufferings as the Lamb of God, we will share in his glory as the Lion of Judah. So let's see what happens now 
in the last finale of my points. Jesus Christ, the King, Judge, and Executor in Revelation 19. I'm going to read Revelation 19 from verse 11 to 16. Now I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. And he who sat on him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. That's when you know it as Jesus. And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on a white horse. A lot of biblical scholars say that that army consists of that bride in Revelation 12 that was raptured after the tribulation. But that's a story for another day. Verse 15, now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword that with it he should strike the nations and he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So Jesus is going to come back and set everything right. Those of you who have been persecuted, who have been offended by people who are not aligned to the woman of Revelation 12, take heart. Jesus will come and set things right. The Bible says in Revel from, from verse 19 to 21, I'm just going to paraphrase. When he comes, when they try and make war against him and his army, Jesus captures I mean, the, 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 the beast is captured, the false prophet is captured, and all the people who are part of the mark of the beast, they're captured, and they are thrown into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone. So Jesus, when he comes back, he is going to set things right. And when he comes, in, before bringing eternal life, he must deal with evil. So he must bring judgment. There is no salvation and eternal life without judgment. That's why Jesus had to die on the cross and take the judgment of God for our sins in order for us to have a chance for salvation. That's the same Jesus is going to keep his promise, promised through an image to John in Revelation 12. He keeps it in Revelation 19 when he comes back and deals with all the disciples of Satan, including Satan himself. Now, the question to you is, where are you going to be aligned? Because if you are aligned with the woman in Revelation 17, Unfortunately, Jesus will have to deal with you whilst he deals with that. Finally, John 3, 16 to 18. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He who believes in him is not condemned. If you are like the woman in Revelation 12, who is submitted to the lamb, who is submitted to him, and you do not love your life until death, irrespective of the suffering and the persecutions and the onslaughts and the tribulations, Guess what? Jesus will come and vindicate you. You will not be condemned. But he who does not believe 
if you choose the way of the woman in Revelation 17, the Bible says in John 3 is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. As Joshua once said, choose you this day whom you will serve. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord, the Lamb, the King. God bless you. I trust that was a challenging yet good word for you. And as we do, uh, tradition in this house is to send you off with a blessing. So may the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May he cause his face to shine upon you. May the Lord turn his countenance upon you and give you peace. Every voice.